way that has completely pushed people out, and it's the land values have gone up so high, um, and it's, it's really a developer's game. Um, and for people who don't know it, there, there used to be mid-rise public housing um, that was torn down, that was called the Reds. Um, and then the whites were the taller ones and they're a separate area. And then you have these little low rises, 1940s era. Um, they were built really sturdy, <laughs> really, really sturdy. And as people were starting to get moved out of them, they just ended up boarding them up. And so now as they, these got boarded up, all this other growth and offices and luxury condos and stuff started popping up around them. And the real estate values sh just shot up. Yeah. Um, it's about, you know, maybe 10 minutes from down, five minutes from downtown, it's just right there. Um, so the only saving grace I think right now is that they could be adapted yeah. into some That's form of housing. Of they should be, yeah. they could be, there's a lot of homeless youth. There's a lot of uh, elder, elders that are suffering from um, displacement or replacement. There's a lot of programs that could be put in there. I don't know. It would, it, it, I don't know what the, the the ethics that would keep people. I don't know what would keep developers at that area in balance, checks and balances, because it's, it's a game of manipulating policy and, and capital that there's there's no interest. There's some, there's like a certain percentage that's required to be allocated to public housing. Yeah, but that's an AMI game. So area median income, if I'm a developer and I go in and I say, I'm going to put in X amount of dollars into this thing and I can get a low income housing tax credit or some kind of credit, as the, as the affordability goes up, I mean, as the market prices go up, a lot of times what you can do is you say X amount of the properties will be affordable but it's actually like 20 or 30% higher than the AMI. It's just the market of that building. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then it becomes a forced emptiness. So there are there are checks and balances to do this. I mean, have you guys ever heard of the poor door? And, 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 uh, in New York? This is yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, there are actual designs oh, yeah. that have separate entrances for people who are not oh. of the same class. Yeah. It, it's literally been named the poor door. So you will go in through the building in a separate entrance to a separate unit to like, and you will never see the other people in that building. So until somebody actually begins to interrogate that, but now think about that from a societal thing, right? That's just a way to frame who's valuable, who's not, there's a lot of different ways with the concept of waste there. Um, but yeah, I know this is a little bit different from your typical waste conversation, right? This is, this is waste of materials and waste of spaces and waste of people and waste. But as you tear down a building, what happens to the soil? Who thinks about the soil? You tear down a building. Can, can you can you grow in any vacant lot? Okay. No. no, because you have a certain level of toxicity in the soil. So where does your soil come from? You bring it in. Bring it in from where? So more and more people are starting to do composting, yeah. and you can get, grab wasted materials from restaurants or supermarkets, it depends on where you're grabbing it for. So where are the spaces to compost? Because our site that we have on a farm is entire, it's two acres of compost. So we've aggregated all of this waste stream, composted it, and created soil. We add red wigglers and add beneficial bacteria through the red wigglers that replenish the nutrients in the soil. The green waste, the bad leaves, and the nitrogen from our farm goes right back into the farm. So we don't have to really do much. <laughs> it kind of just begins to, the capillary action of the soil is so nice that the water, we don't, we water off of the hydrant and rain. And we can go for four or five days with no water at that site for certain crops. It's really interesting. So the question is like, why don't we do this in the city? Yeah. Have you done testing on the soil? Because 
I would think here in the US when you compost, you compost like everything. It's also like banana peels that are not organic. So there would be all kind of. So we are, com we are, we are checking our soil by soil experts. So I'm not checking it. There's a company called um, uh, Purple Cow Organics that does, they're a partner of ours and they just, they, they pull together all the waste stream from select entities from uh, Wisconsin and Illinois. And they have uh, delivery systems and that kind of, I mean, it's literally just the soil production. Uh, they're also part of, an in, uh, of a cooperative initiative that's 1,030 something people deep that makes one billion dollars <coughs> a year through a co-op. It's crazy. So, um, now, it is a way forward. There are a lot of ways to rethink of it. I mean, people kind of just think of it really reductively and think like, oh, you just do one way and it take, solves the problem. Absolutely not. But it is a very effective way to rethink waste streams. The wood chips from our site are from private wood, wood uh, the chipping companies that go to residential. Every time there's a storm in Chicago, a lot of trees come down. Or um, Now, you don't want to get a certain kind of diseased tree or what have you, but there's the, 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 the folks that are doing wood chipping and getting the wood from residential areas or certain other commercial areas, they get fined like $100 or something per drop off if it goes to a certain site. So if it comes to us, it's free. So a lot of the stuff that would go to otherwise to the landfill for the city actually comes to us. One of the reasons we also keep, have you ever, you know that you can, wood chips are amazing for keeping moisture in the site as well. So they'll block the sunlight out, but then you'll have moisture that stays underneath. If you ever add wood chips, it's incredible. In forests, and it just takes care of itself. So we always have moisture in the site. We always have biodiversity in the site. We've got lots of things happening in the site. But the more we can do testing through other entities, the better. Problem is most of the people that have the money to do the testing want to control the data. So then it just doesn't work. <laughs> And then you have, it's a, it's a human infrastructure issue. If you have only a certain amount of people on the team and you're busy doing all this other work, then who's got the time to sit down and monitor and measure all that information? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. Yep. What do you do in the winter? At that particular site, you let it go down. Um, the, we're getting to a point where the city's starting to rethink their investment into the site as an actual farm so that they would put in, they would help put in the, the greenhouses, they would help put in, it's interesting, imagine if that site became part of a parks department, which makes sense. Like if you have, if you're increasing the tax base, the site that we're in has gone up $110,000 in two years in value. So if we're increasing the tax base, we're asking for a percentage to go into the infrastructure development of that site. So it can be considered a park. And then there's a public park, because it's a community park, it's a community site. Uh, the indoor, we go, we go year-round indoors. 